So here we are, part three, the core of the circle. So earlier in this sort of study, we looked at the, the fruit in the tree and how that tree symbolically exists or allegorically exists everywhere in the world, every religion, every culture. And we also discovered this Encyclopedia Britannia, Britannica, not that we should trust <laughs> anything that's written there, but we also learned from the Encyclopedia Britannica that this tree, this concept of tree, or the tree of life, is one tree, it's one of the same tree. It is the same tree, there is one tree. And every culture had this idea of this one tree. So then we looked at the, the spine and the body. So I'll just say about the tree again. The tree, we, we looked at who cut us off from the tree and why does the what we call the Bible even mention that we're cut off from the tree and even give us an identity of who cut us from the tree. What was so important about the tree? So obviously the tree is something to do with giving us eternal life. Now as we've seen in the first part, we were deceived by that entity, yud he var he and that, that entity was not the creator of all. So what was so important about the tree, and um, what did the creator, why did the creator put us on the tree in, in the first place, bearing in mind that it is one tree, and that every culture all over the earth believed in this one tree. Well, the tree itself clearly has something to do with our DNA. And we look briefly at that in the spine and the body in the second part. Um, we looked in detail how the body functions, how the salt crystals work through the body and how these crystals and energies, these electrical fields, interact with the electrical fields over us, which are the planets. So, we're now going to look at the core of the circle. Now the question is, what is the core of the circle? And hopefully this presentation will relay, relay that concept to you uh, and make it real. One thing I want to one thing I want to mention for those who do follow my work and know the type of posts that I put out, one of the most important things in, in all this is the language and spells. Um, everything has a duality, and what we take for granted as a definition of one word may not actually be what that word is, and we see that with um, the legal system that we're, we're dealing with. Um, the word person doesn't mean a living being, but a persona. An act, a parliament, is what they need to bring against you in order to bring a crime or a sin against you. Um, so words don't always mean what they seem, and I want us to bear this in mind as we move into this presentation, the core of the circle. So we begin with this, an ark, Noah. I said an ark. Now, it's very interesting we've ever done this picture because you have three hills in the background there. They look like pyramids. But for me, who who studies these things and um, the heavens, you've also got the birds flying in line here, which is quite amazing. But it is funny because, well, I'm, I'm, by talking about this, we're missing the point here of... Of um, this meme, an ark, Noah. I said an ark, and what we see here is an arch. Very, very similar words. So, what I'm trying to show is what we read and take literally. Or well, what I'm hoping to show in this presentation it might not. What we we say and what we mean may 
be two different things altogether. So what is the Ark? Did a physical Ark actually exist? Or is there something more? Maybe it's a threefold manifestation. What do you mean by that, Stephen? Threefold manifestation? You're sounding very Christian. Well, funny enough, everybody's talking very Christian recently. <laughs> the threefold manifestation that I'm talking about is as above, so below, and so within. Or as above, so below, and so outward, as some may say. Now, the ark itself may be a physical thing. I'm not denying the, the physicality of the ark or any of the things that we read in scriptures. I think there's much more to it. I think there's a threefold interpretation to to most things because things are being manifest from the eternal into the upper realms and into our present time. Um, the upper realms is what we see, the heavens, uh, and they never change. So, did this physical ark actually exist, or is there something more? When we think of the ark, what is the first thing that we usually imagine? Something like this? A wooden boat floating on the high seas on the water? With a little giraffe and a bear and a lion, Neil, <laughs> a lion, a zebra from black and white. This is what we see all the time when we think of Noah and the ark. But what if the ark is something different? When was the last time we looked into the heavens? People will be saying, but we can't, they're spraying the heavens, they're spraying the skies, we can't see the skies anymore. I'm telling you, if you get out, you'll be able to see the heavens. When was the last time anybody actually took the time to go in, out of the city or out of the town and, and look up into the heavens? Has anybody ever noticed the giraffe in the heavens? It's there. Right there. Look. A giraffe. A bear. Now, we all know about the great bear. We know what that is, don't we? Sometimes things are just hidden in plain sight, as we've been saying for the last few years. So, the Ark may not be just a physical thing. It may also be manifest in the heavens, and this is what I'm going to show today, that the Ark that we read of, and the flood that we read of from the waters above and the waters below, and that we read of the, the, the waters of heaven opened for Noah. No means rest. But anyway, we're not going to go off in one. <laughs> um, I'm going to continue here. Is this really what the art looks like? Now, I just love looking at these images of um, the Stellarium software, but the beauty in the artwork is just amazing. But art aside, the artwork aside, we forget, or I forget, we're actually looking at the movement of the constellations, the heavens above us here. This is what we're looking at. And the reason why I put this particular screenshot is because it shows us the arc. Now anybody can see here is Scorpio, where the bright sun is at this time. And I took this screenshot. So you've got the sun and Scorpio and Libra. You get Virgo, Leo, Cancer, Gemini, all the way through to Aries, Pisces, Aquarius, Andromeda, Cassiopeia, Cephas, the House of Cephas, the Great King, and then Draco, and then above that we've got Cygnus the Swarm, which you can't really see, and everyone knows this one here, the Hippo, sorry, the Horse, that's where we get the word Hippophalamus, Horse which to do with the brain, eh? but the horse, the pegasus, which of course Islam, the moon god, the moon, and we'll talk about the moon god, Sin, the ancient Chaldean moon god. 
And over here we have Ophicius wrestling the great snake and as I've said in another post if you look at other videos I've actually spoken about this three pillars or these three steps which some say are the three steps in masonry taking you up to collect your crown or your crown here and but here is the ark and it's even written in the name because from Libra and to the ancient world Scorpio was seen as the tree of life the upper head of Scorpio and its legs were seen as the upper branches and the canopy of the, the great tree and the lower part was seen as the entrance to the underworld so we have here the, the image of the wolf which is lupus being slain but lupus is actually over here but this is the area of the wolf this area the area of the dog but right here is the core of the circle right here is the ark of the covenant now people talk about flat earth and the dome and all this kind of stuff now look at this look here this is the horizon the straight horizon the houses as the sun comes through the houses not uh, also known as the ecliptic this this straight line here is the ecliptic ecliptic from scorpio libra virgo leo all the way through to pisces and aquarius and then and, and then up and but this here is the bar this is the level as i've said on numerous other posts for those who follow me on facebook this is the level and everything above the level above the bar lev is uh, levi a uh, heart everything above the heart is the mind of god or the ark of god anyway giving too much away here we'll move on stargazing the earliest records of stargazing the earliest, earliest evidence of us studying the heavens comes from a cave painting dating from about 25,000 BCE before the common era where lunar cycles now this is very important where lunar cycles were being recorded not the Sun and as we go on through this and hopefully as this weekend the talks you you'll see that the Sun um, really represents us but the sun has been the object of worship in all religions and cultures or the snake but really in the beginning of time the earliest evidence before we worshipped anything or uh, gave ourselves deities or gods or names of gods the earliest paintings 25,000 years BCE so you're talking well, we don't know what time we're in, so <laughs> whether we're in the year 2000 or the year 1000, but we're talking about twenty five to 30,000 years ago, at least. They were recording not sun worship, but the moon. Why is that important? Well, in Genesis 1.14 of the Christian Bible, <laughs> it's not Christian at all. Genesis 1.14, the Elohim, leaves the instruction that we shall observe the sun the moon and the stars and they shall be as signs and seasons for us in other words the sun the moon and the stars predict our calendar and as we go on here we'll see exactly how precise our calendar is how we predict it uh, and how we calculate time basically so interesting people were not worshipping the sun they were interesting in the moon which is, if anyone knows, it's the moon, the feminine energy, the moon which determines the magnetism, the sun that determines the electro spectrum. So you have this electromagnetic, we are electric, and this environment is an electromagnetic world. But our ancestors were interested in the moon, and they drew or carved pictures of the moon rather than the sun. Even today, everything is to do with the worship of the sun. If you go to anywhere, every church is facing east to the sun. Every Masonic lodge, the master or mason or the grand master's chair of the altar is always facing east. But east was not the direction. And if anybody's familiar with the work of Andrew Collins, who uh, wrote the book The Cygnus Mystery and, st and other, he's done lots of stuff, and him and Hume Newman and people like that. If you're familiar with Andrew Collins' work, he tells you even the pyramids at Giza, um, the east to west, the following of the sun east to west, 
was not the final uh, destination for the soul or the spirit of the being or for the pharaoh or the god. In fact, north was the, the direction. And it was the sun and the moon calculating both together, but really the, the lunar cycle that determined uh, the beginning of your days. Anyway, anyway, which we've lost now, because everything is worshipping self, the son of God, the sun. Anyway, anyway, stargazing. Our ancestors recognised that there were four critical moments during each year that they needed to recognise and be able to predict. Oh, I wish it was like the ancestors. Oh, <laughs> I wish it was back in the days when, when it was only four critical moments in life to worry about. Every day there's 40, 50 <laughs> critical moments to think about, but our ancestors knew that there were four critical moments during each year, and that's all they needed to worry about. They had to be able to predict that. Why? Harvesting, food, planting, rains, they had to know the seasons. Eh? These times are when the sun reaches its strongest on the longest day of the year, the summer solstice, which is when Prince William was induced to be born. But anyway, that's another story. The Son of God. When the sun reaches its strongest and the long of, longest day of the year, the summer solstice. The thing is, people, why am I mentioning William? <laughs> William was induced on this day. And Diana records it. Diana's the moon. Well, you, well I am. Well, I am. Your own will, your will, your desire to be God, to be the image of. Well, I am was induced, we are told, by the moon. Goddess Diana on the summer solstice. Anyway, when this, so we have the sun when it reaches the strong, the, um, the strongest on the longest day of the year, which is the summer solstice. When the sun is at its weakest on the shortest day of the year, which is the winter solstice, and then the midpoints between the solstices, uh, where the night and day are equal. This is the autumnal, autumnal equinox and the vernal equinox also known as the spring equinox. So we have these four times throughout the year. We actually have eight wheels or eight spokes on the Celtic calendar because we subdivided these further in the Western uh, Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, can we say that? Can we not say Hemisphere? Yeah, we have a hemisphere in the brain, don't we? So we're not in, in, insulting any flat earthers. But yeah, the Hemisphere. So. So we have this idea of the brain, the head, the sun, the moon, and everything split into four, you see. Anyway, anyway, anyway. So how did they keep time? They didn't have Casio watches or, you know, an iPhone that updated the time automatically. How did they keep the time? Before we had all this technology, how did they know what time it was? The name of this presentation should give it away, the core of the circle. The core of the circle. Now what I'm speaking here is nothing, any. it's not any different from what is in the Bible. The Bible tells us there is Elohim, there are gods, there are planets. And it tells us in the New Testament that those planets, some of those planets, kept not their first abode. What does that mean? They didn't keep the order that they should have went in and they decided, I'm going to do it myself. I'll and these planets, angels, are the rebellious ones. Now, how, how, how do we know that these things actually existed? We'll get to that. I'll show you. I'll prove it to you. Everybody that ever was in the past, anybody, wanted to be a god. In fact, every coin, every bank note, with every royal member's head is declaring that they are a deity. But we'll get to that. How did they... How did they calculate the heavens so precisely? Now, I know I talk about standing stones, and it's my hobby, it's something that I love. Uh, I calculate where the standing stones are laid and how they came up, and our ancestors done this. That was their calendar. But how did they do it? It's obvious, by the stars. But this image we should all be familiar with. And no, it's not a Nazi uh, swastika. I'm not calling on 
the Norse people or the German or Germanic people to go to war again. <laughs> but why did the Germans use it? Well, why did the Hindus use it? Why did anybody use it? Why did the Nordic people use it? This here is a, an image of uh, Yggdrasil, the great tree, which is very interesting because this is what it all connects to, the canopy of the heavens, the body, the core, the circle, it all connects to this great tree that manifests itself from where? The North Star. What we're looking at here is the Big Dipper, the Pan, the Plough, Arthur the Great Bear, Ursa Major, as it moves in when? It's four seasons, which was really what our ancestors felt was so important. They calculated the four seasons. How did they do that? You're looking at it. You're looking at the giant clock in the sky. Our father, the clock. Arthur, the great clock. With the North Star, right at the tip of every part of the pan. It's interesting that um, no, no, I'm not even going to go there. We'll just leave it just now. Pan. Like, remember this pan. It's known as the pan. Pan is the first deity worldwide. It's known as the first god. Pan. It's probably where we get the word pantheon, which is the temple where all the gods come from. And bear in mind that this centre, this north star, is seen as the centre of the universe. This is where everything comes from, and I'll, I'll prove that to you. Even to this day, I'll prove that, that this still is the case. Everything comes from this great clock. There is a perpetual clock hanging in the northern sky. Not the western sky, not the eastern sky, but to the north. And it can be seen anywhere in the world. The edge of the Big Dipper, Ursa Major, is the hour hand for this backward running 24 hour timepiece. What do you mean Stephen? A 24 hour timepiece? There's 24 hours in the day, there's 24 Levi's, a levy, a tax, a way, 24 hours in the day, Horace, 24 is a magic number, 24 letters in certain alphabets. So 24 elders, 24 Language is everything. We're going to go out and look at some stuff. I can't cover everything in this, but we're going to cover some stuff. So here's this clock in the sky. And here we can see Ursa Major with its pan and its tail. And at this, in this image here, it's sitting at 1600 hours. So you get 1800 hours. Notice how it goes backwards? It's in reverse. So as this moves round the heavens, it gives the time. Yeah, so at 8 o'clock in the day, the tail will be here, 6 o'clock in the day, dawn will be there, midnight, um, yeah, midnight, <laughs> the tail will be there, noon, down here. So the me this method only works in the, the north, where the dipper is more often above the horizon. The further north you go, the longer the dipper is visible. At latitudes greater than 41 degrees north, it never sets. Read that again. At latitudes greater than 41 degrees north, it never sets. Now, this is interesting. I'm not going to go into this just now either, but there are 42 stages. A uh, gestation period, 42 weeks of a woman's pregnancy. There are 42 uh, months or three and a half years in Jesus' ministry. There are 42... Uh, stages of wandering in the wilderness of Zin um, when the Israelites come out of Egypt. <laughs> I'll go into that. But 42 is a very important number. We have 41 degrees north is where Ursa Major sits and it never sets. It's always seen. So we, have, we can see it in the sky. Wherever you were, you could see Ursa Major in the sky and you can see the North Star. So further south it skims below the horizon at its lowest arc. Read that again. Further south it skims below the horizon at its lowest arc. Arc. 
we began this asking, you know, what is the ark? <laughs> the ark is in the heavens. So it revolves in a counterclockwise direction, as I've mentioned, around the North Star Polaris. Now, let me not forget this. This is the focal point. Not Arthur the Great Bear, but what Arthur follows. He's the follower, the one who follows. What is he following? He's following the North Star. It revolves in a counterclockwise direction around the North Star. Polaris. Languages of the Poles. Polaris. We're policed. We're told what we can do according to the law, what we can't do. And it's police enforcement that tell us what we can. So the word Polaris keeps us in check. And it is visible in the night sky, or most of the night sky. So what is so important about the Great Bear and Polaris? Well, I've mentioned some of that. Why the importance? But let's look at some of uh, things in history. At the end of the day, it's how we navigated the high seas. High seas? High sea, anybody? Anybody lost at sea? The ancient Egyptians, sorry, say it again. The ancient Egyptians considered the stars of the Big Dipper and Polaris to be part of the leg of a giant bull. You pull on my leg. <laughs> no, the Egyptians considered the stars of the Big Dipper and Polaris to be part of the leg of a giant bull. Now, remember, I showed you on a level, Levi tax. A levy is what you pay when you're old. The level, the bar, you're on the level when you've reached Orion's Belt, the bar. Orion's Belt is a journey from Libra, Scorpio, Libra, through to Aries and then up, off the bar, out of the bar, out of the papal bull. So it's interesting that the Egyptians considered the star, the Big Dipper, and Polaris, Polaris to be the leg of the great bull, meaning there's a great bull, a papal bull, a great bull. It also means when you look at things this way, <laughs> when the, we read that the children of Israel worshipping the bull or the baal, there's much more to it. Why were there so many baals? They were all called baals. You see where I'm going with this? So the Egyptians considered the stars of the Big Dipper and Polaris to be part of the leg of a giant bull. Bull in the Ark. The horns over the, the Ark of the Covenant, you see. The story of the Great Bear appeared in Homer's Odyssey, which dates back to the 9th century BC. So we'll move on to the Aetherian legends. In the Aetherian legends of Europe, it was referred to as King Arthur's chariot. Very interesting, chariot. That word chariot in Hebrew is Merkava. A chariot. A chariot is an ascension vehicle that brings you up into your higher being. Into the sonship of God that you are. So a very interesting Arthur. It was Arthur's chariot, was it, eh? So we have the bear, Arthur. Did I mention the Arthur Arcta? Is a Welsh word for bear. Anyway, it was seen as the round table. Oh, interesting. Arthur and the round table. So, you see, we have these stories of the Bible, and we have these stories of Mesopotamia, Babylonia, we have the Egyptian stories, we have all these stories. We have stories of Arthur, we have stories on television, Coronation Street, <laughs> and we believe them. We have these stories and we actually believe the stories and you see that the whole world changes because it's been on television and they've read it in a book. But really these stories all have an origin somewhere up there in the heavens, in the great wheel. People think that the Bible and other books and all that is just nonsense. <laughs> They're hidden treasures. 
every story and every book and every word that's ever been printed or said or uttered is worth listening to. There's a spell for everything. There's a reason and a time, period of time, a spell for all things. As the Bible says, there's a time to live, a time to die, a time to laugh, a time to cry. We should never throw anything out. What else do we have here? So this great wheel in the sky, the SWAT sticker, the plough, Arthur, was also known as the wagon. I'm off the wagon. I'm on the wagon. A wagon. <coughs> wagon wheels. Mm. A wagon. A wagon is a carriage vehicle, a ve something, a vessel to carry you. Yeah? A plough and a pan. Now, we mentioned pan already. That Pan is the first god in most most classical thoughts, most religious schools will accept that Pan was the first day to the, the Pan with the pipes and we just had a Pan demic. Anyway, moving on. Modern druids hold an ancient tradition which refers to the winter solstice as Alban Arthur or Arthur's time. This is winter time, coming into winter. See how this story is so connected to the story of the Christ. We have the Son of God, or the Sun, entering into its darker period. Coming to the great table, to the north. <laughs> the upper room. Yeah. Several things point us in the direction of Arthur being honoured as a sun god, or at least a solar hero in some sort of way, much like Hercules or Heracles, whose twelve labours describes the sun's journey. The twelve labours of Her Hercules are about the sun's journey. Go and read it. From east to west, then sharp north. And like Sir Andrew Collins, um, who wrote the Cygnus Mysteries, he, he will tell you, I mentioned this just short, a little while ago there, he will tell you that Orion's belt, the east to west of the sun, is not the final destination of the sun, nor was it the final destination of the pharaoh, nor is it the final de destination of us. Arthur's wheel, Arthur's table, and the twelve houses and the twelve constellations that spin around that great wheel in the north star, nothing moves from that pole star, from that north star. Everything circles around that. The only thing that moves from that are the gods who we have been made to worship. The planets. We even call the days after the planets. The gods. What I'm trying to show you here is you are God. You make your way through the twelve houses from east to west, then north, up through the twelve houses. There's only a it's simple. Every year, year on year in coming into the darker months and then springing forward. Like all the all the other great heroes, Arthur dies. But like Jesus, you sure yeah. He dies. And he's put in a cave or under a hill. I'm not even going to suggest where that hill is. We all know my opinion on the hill. I know where Arthur's seat, Arthur's hill is and I know the line in which he will come up. Uh, in us, in the Christ oil, in us, I know how it operates. But anyway, like all the other great hero, Arthur dies and rests in a cave on a hill, and he shall return as king, we are told. Returning king, returning Christ. The once and future king. He's associated with the wild hunt. As the king of the dead, this is exactly the same story as Osiris. Osiris is not just king of the dead, he is the dead king. <laughs> and the winter months is when he collects the souls. Now, what does this mean? Does, does this Arthur of legend actually, do people believe that Arthur hides in a cave somewhere waiting to come back because he's dead, but he's not really dead because he's coming back and he'll in the meantime, every winter he collects the souls. It, it sounds wicked, it sounds horrible, it sounds evil. It's not about that, it's about collecting your conscious emotions and building yourself up, collecting um, your, your thoughts, your soul thoughts. 
in the darker times of your life, in the winter months. What, why? So that when the spring comes, you can rise out of your darkness and come out from your dark cave, your 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 place where you where the where a bear where the, a bear hibernates, where you go within yourself. But instead, they've made this period, which is not a bad thing. They've made this period of Christmas and the winter months all about money and material, and and this is what all these stories are about. It's about getting out of your material, <laughs> out of the emotional, and into your sovereignty as the once and future king, God. You're the image of God. So he's associated with the wild hunt, much like Diana, much like Odin. Anybody remember, we actually, a few months, no, a few months ago, a few years ago there, eh, when Trump was in power, we had, you know, the White House being invaded by the guy all dressed up as Odin or a Viking or whatever he was. The wild hunt, coming into your darker months, it happened around about December, January, if I remember right. I mean, they're showing us this stuff. They're showing us that you should be going within yourself. Why? Why is the hunt going? Because the destroyer's out there to take you in the darker months. There's no light. The, the darkness has come. So Hasatan, the evil inclination, the evil... There's no devil. It's not... A, Hasatan is the, the Saturn energy, the, the Saturn and Jupiter energies that bring negativity. And in the darker months, because we have less sun, sunlight, we get seasonal depression. <laughs> Sad, they've even got a name for it now. But this time of the year is about you, the once and future king or queen. And you're going to be getting through this wild uh, hunt. And what is the wild hunt? It's written up there in the heavens. I'll, I'll leave that for another presentation. Don't want to go off. But that central belt, Orion's belt, is the great hunt of Diana. It's the purging away of the sin, the, the, the moon goddess, the sin um, within us. That's what sin is. Sin is the moon goddess. Ur of the Chaldees. Ab Abram was told, get out of your father's house, get away from the gods, get out of it. What were the gods? Well, the goddess of Ur of the Chaldees, which was northern Scotland, uh, Caledonia, but that's another story. Ur is where we get the word Ireland as well, um, you know, Orkney, or, or, Orkney. Ur of the Chaldees worshipped the moon. The goddess Diana, to, to the Ur of the, to the Chaldeans, or to some of the Chaldean priests who were not keeping the way of the father, or the straight way, they, they worship deities. This is what I'm trying to show that we've always worshipped deities, but this these stories all represent you, the deity, you, the God, you, the image of the Most High. You represent the sun, and this journey of the sun through the heavens represents the journey that you must take. You must take up your cross daily, just as the sun goes from east to west through the houses and back again, and then up to the north, so too you must ascend up into the upper room, up to the north, into the upper chamber, the third chamber, the highest chamber, out of the reptilian mind, into the mid mind, which is logic, out of the fight and flight reptilian mind, which is lower consciousness, into the mid consciousness, and then up into the upper room, which is to the north, the great bear. where we go through, <laughs> go through that portal, that wormhole to reach the Father. Not, not manipulated by the powers and energies of the swirling entities we understand as the heavens and planets, but allowing them to work through us, understanding how each planet works through our birth chart, to bring us through Arthur, the great spiral wheel, into that northern point of the sky where we become purified in the upper room and we go through the wall now we read the story of jesus walk through the wall and he appeared to them what what, what what was that that's going into the eternal now most of us have seen these type of draw uh, pictures images this is just an image i've taken and, and all i've done to it is put a, a color tone on it but this is a, a screenshot of a video 
speeded up a time lapse video showing the north and right here in the centre you have Polaris and this here is all the planets so they're going the other way remember they're going backwards okay so they're spinning and this is all of creation everything comes from this point of creation the core of the circle and it expands out into creation all of creation all the stars all the planets every little twinkling thing you see up there twinkle twinkle little star how I wonder what you are everything up there manifests from this central port point the core of the circle and this is what our ancestors knew our journey take up your cross daily is the journey of the Son of God you and I now before anybody gets but I'm a, a, a female or I'm non-binary it doesn't matter what you call yourself really I'm not caring about that we're Bene Elohim we are the sons as in the sun the light of the world you are the light of the world we are the sons of the Elohim there are no genders God is not a man that he should lie nor the son of man that he should change his mind but God is not a man go and read your scriptures the Elohim the most high is both male and female created Adam in his image created he male and female Adam was both but anyway that's going somewhere else what I'm trying to show you here is you are here out of all those billions of stars you are journeying from the moment you appeared in this celestial clock you are journeying backwards probably <laughs> as the heavens show us but you are going backwards in life and time you are reversing the clock Arthur was taken away in a barge by three queens, according to the legend. I'm not going to go down this road because I've spent long enough on this presentation so far, but who are the three queens? Well, the three queens, I would suggest, are the ancient Brigante Bridget, Bridget, the goddess Bridget. So, yeah, the bridge, the way we get the word bridge. A bridge to where? The afterlife. Okay, according, what was that bridge? To the Nordic people, to the Scandinavian, to, to Odin and, and the Vikings, that bridge was the Bifrost. Bi mean jewel, double, frost. No, hell freezes over. <laughs> uh, it was a bridge over to from the underworld to the upper world. So Arthur was taken away in a barge by three queens, the Bridget, the bridges. Also up. Britain you have the spine of Albion you have the meridian line and you have the rose line three queens anyway continue on we've seen that manifest in the rose of Lancaster and the rose of York two blue rose uh, blue rose and a red rose but the spine of Albion being the mid rose the three queens which carry the souls the three pillars of masonry which carry the souls up into where the great in masonry it would be the great circle or um the Ark of Heaven, see back to the Ark again, the Arch of Heaven, the Royal Arch. I'm not going to go down there, we're not here to talk about masonry, I'm talking about the, who you are, where you are in this creation and how you're manifest in this world. That's what another talk. So Arthur was taken away in a barge, a bar. Legal system anyone? Spell barge. B-A-R-G. It's got an E on the end, but just imagine the G is the last letter. What's the letter G? Number seven. Masons. G. I'm not going to get caught in Masons again, but they're hiding in plain sight what's there. The bar is the legal system. A barge is a boat. The Egyptians travelled over. The Pharaoh, Osiris, they travelled over on a barge, a boat, a celestial boat, through the heavens. And as I've already said, Orion's belt was not the final gest destination. The final destination was north. So... According to legend, he was born to the heaven on a celestial barge, as above, so below. Alternatively, Arthur's ch uh, called Arthur's chariot, back to the word Merkaba, uh, or Merkaba, uh, which is the Kabbalah, you know, ascension up the tree, the, Mer the Merkaba, or the Merkabot. Um, 
you know, so the pathways through the trees, which of, of course is all to do with the constellations, the heavens as well, and the great tree. We spoke about the great tree in the very beginning. There is one tree, and there is one way, <laughs> and one path, and one chariot, and it's up there, into the north. Also known as Arthur's Wain, Arthur's Wagon, corresponding to the ploughs, the stars, or the bark of the sun as it sails into the underworld before returning with the dawn as the reborn sun. You see this? Yeah. Yes, the story of every hero, every god. It's the same story. They ride on a barge. The law is a barge that sits in water. So we sail into the underworld before returning in the in the spring as the reborn son of God. Skipped a bit there. Let's go back. <laughs> Let's go forward. Arthur's name. Arthur means the bear man. The language is a grizzly. I keep saying this. The word bear could mean a grizzly bear, but it could also mean bear as a naked. I think of the tree in Adam and Eve. Where are you? I'm naked. I'm bare. Maybe I'm just jumping. But it, I'm jumping to conclusions here. But it's it's language of spells. We're under spells. Uh, and everything's allegorical. Everything's pictorial. And everything's written in the heavens for us to know. So I know for a fact that the word bear and bar are connected to the legal system. So anyway, Arthur's name means the bear man. Or the great bear. His bear is naked, as, as pure as you come on the day you were born before your prayer. The bear man, the great bear, who stands before our father, Arthur. He has always been associated with the constellation of the great bear, which is called after him. Or he was called after it, I don't know. Which, remember, was called Arthur's Wayne. Now, words are spells. Arthur's Wayne. If you come from Glasgow and you say, go and tell the wain to come in for their dinner. They're not talking about bringing the wagon in, bringing the motor in for something to eat, <laughs> bringing the car in, the vehicle, the Volkswagen. A wain is a child, which is interesting because you see the concepts of everything. Everything comes from Arthur. Everything comes from that North Star. All ch everything's born of above. Yeah, you must be born of above. <laughs> everything born of above comes down here you must be reborn of above every day take up your cross daily but any a wane is a child a kid in Glasgow and it comes probably from the ancient Celtic word for a child to wean a child from the breast milk and very important this all these connections because the breast milk represents inanna or nut the goddess Nut, which is also, Inanna is also the moon goddess, Sin, but and, and, and Nut, the Egyptian goddess, spread over the canopy of the heavens like an ark, our body, and our breasts hang, hung down, and the milk of our breasts is the Milky Way, what we understand, and this portion of the plough, Arthur, is that portion in the heavens, the Milky Way, where the breasts represent uh, the spillage of, of, of all created things. The breast milk. So interesting that the word Wayne, Arthur's Wayne, is obviously the old Celtic word, but a Wayne is related to a child, um, to Scot many Scots Scottish people. Probably English too. I'm sure everybody's heard the saying a Wayne. Anyway, a Wayne a manger. Anyway, sometimes it was just known as Arthur's Plough, depending on where you lived. So we have all these different names, but it all depends what, not language you spoke, but what uh, dialect of the Brittany, uh, Celtic or Gallic tongue you spoke. But it's all hidden in where we came from. It's all hidden in the heavens. It's all there. In Wales, the southern Brittany people, as they navigated the high seas, now I'm going to take this further with the legal, because everything legal and, and, and lawful and the system of the Argos Navi, of the citizenship and all that, that's all there in the heavens. It's all there, but that's for another time, we'll teach that another time. What I'm trying to show you is that everything up there is our clock and everything is our journey. 
as we take up our cross, we cross over the ecliptic up into the cross, uh, which is Cygnus the Swan. So anyway, in Wales, the southern Britonic people navigated the high seas north through ancient Albion. Their steadfastness was the immovable heavens, the immortal stars they called Brid Arthur, Arthur's table, described as a large, round, immovable table, or a barge. A barge floats in water, maritime, yeah? Mar, maritime. Yeah? Just dropping little bits here, hoping that some of you catch where, where this is all going and how it all ties together. Following the Great Bear is the constellation of booties. Many people have heard of that. The Herdsman, with its brightest star, Arcturus, or Bear Keeper, the Keeper of the Bear. When it first rises over the eastern horizon, not long after the winter solstice each year, it means that spring, the Son of God, is a way to raise up, be raised up. The sun is on its way as it gains strength. And you should be gaining strength from the light of the sun. You should have spent that time looking within, not into the material. What did I get? What did I bring me? What did we have for Christmas dinner? What did we have for New Year? What did we do? How much friends have I got for, uh, at that time of year? Am I on my own? You should be, I'm not saying you should be on your own, but it should be a time of self and inner reflection where you, everything's cast out. All the gods, all their systems, everything is cast out and you're preparing yourself to be raised as the image of the creator, the sun, with the Christ in you for the springtime or for the new season coming. Remember there's this big wheel that's split into four, eight in the Celtic, but it divides up eh, how you behave and how you think and what, what you value in life, really. This is what we've lost. We're not looking up there in the heavens anymore. We're looking down here and what we need and what we think we need and what we should have. And you've got it all. You've got to deny yourself. It doesn't mean you can't have anything, but you've got to deny this world and everything of it and go deep within and realise that, that you're, you're making this journey just as the sun. And you will one day die just as the sun dies, but you will be raised again. Arturus is known as the one who comes. This is you and I and the Christ in us. Take up your cross daily. Now I've mentioned that a few times already. And this cross is this journey up the tree taking a right hand turn for the soul to be purged and cleansed through the Rhine, through the Great River, to be bathed in the Jordan, to rise up into the upper room. That's taking up the cross daily. And yes, it does have a geographical location. And they've done their best to try and hide the geographical lands, the biblical lands the sacred lands, and where the tree is, but as we have already discovered in the first presentation, there is one tree that every culture believed existed. It was a, phys it was a physical tree. And uh, if you're here in the United Kingdom, or Britain, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, whatever you want to call it here, um, if you're on these lands, you're on these sacred lands and on the branches of a great tree. Do you know how to travel through it? That's the thing. Do you know how to take up your cross? Cursed is the man who hangs in the tree, it says in the scriptures. What does that mean? Remember, Jesus wasn't hung on the tree, we're told. He was hung on a wooden cross. But the scripture doesn't say that. It says, cursed is the man that hangs in the tree. What tree? You see, we, we have teaching, Christian teaching. We think he walked about with a big wooden you know, X on his back, a wooden stake. He had a wooden something on his back, he carried a wooden log. I'm not saying that he didn't exist, I'm not saying that the story is not real. I don't want to steal that from anyone. If you want to continue believing the stories, you can, but it goes much, much deeper. Even the Christ says that himself, it, it, it's you. This is you. 
<laughs> so each of us have to take up our cross. What is that taking up the cross? It's quite simply just the journey of the sun through the core of the circle. We're living in an electromagnetic world. You can't change the laws of physics or, or electromagnetism. There's only one way through every day. You've got to take that journey every day, take up your cross daily. There's no coming back. The sun doesn't come back. That's what people are, you know, they're doing regression and uh, re life regression and past life regression. And well, how do you know you were even here before? The physics of it all doesn't work. It's impossible to come back. Maybe it's possible to be regurgitated. I'm not saying that it's not possible to have multiple lives, but I get a lot of people contacting me saying, I was this person and I was that person. You know how many people I get who were Mary Queen of Scots? I've had about four or five so far, but they can't all be Mary Queen of Scots. <laughs> I get people saying that, you know, they were a Jac Jacobite um, soldier. And sometimes I have to look and go, hey, you're the same person that <laughs> contacted me from Hamilton or from Bishop Briggs or from Inverness. But, you know, you can't both be the same person. So what I'm trying to show here and, and uh, is to throw away the religious and spiritual nonsense and to try and help people to see through. I'm not saying reincarnation is not possible. We'll leave that for another talk, but uh, that's not what you're here to focus on. You're here to focus on this life and this daily journey, what you have today and what you have now, and that daily journey through this great tree. The point in thinking in the past, I think that the future, what you're going to be in the future when you're still here and you're not making use of what you've got here, is there? So, you know, it's all about you. You are the Bene Elohim, the son, or the daughter, the son of God. Greenwich Mean Time, anyone? Greenwich Mean Time? What's that got to do with anything, Stephen? Well, we're looking at this alignment in the heavens. Greenwich Mean Time, does anybody know what Greenwich Mean Time is? If you type into any search engine, Greenwich Mean Time, and obviously I've done this at 5.28 this morning, um, on the 27th of November, um, but Greenwich Mean Time, it will tell you there exactly what it is. And what it says is Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT, was established in 1884. Interesting. 84, 1984, 1884. Anyway, they changed the time. When at the International Meridian Conference, look at that word, Mary is water, Dan, Diana, is, Deus is God, Deus, the water God. Mm. Anyway, when at the International Meridian Conference it was decided to place the prime, meridian, prime by the way is the very first word in the Bible, Bereshit bara, prime meridian with the head, with thought, with consciousness created he, the Elohim. That's what it says, Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim, with consciousness, with the primordial thought, with the prime focus. God, the creator, created the Elohim. So Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT, was established in 1884 when at the International Meridian Conference, it was decided to place the Prime Meridian at Greenwich. And there's the clock at Greenwich. Look at the clock. It's a 24-hour clock. Ooh, I wonder why that is. Arthur the Great Bear, I wonder. Indeed, even Greenwich, and this is a quote. Um, I can't remember who it is. It's at the very end. But this is a quote regarding the Greenwich Mean Time Clock and the calculation of time. It's quite difficult to read, so it'll be hard to understand, so I'll break it down and tell you what it's saying afterwards. But let me read it. Indeed, even the Greenwich Meridian itself is not quite what it used to be, defined by the centre of the transit instrument at the observatory at Greenwich. Although that instrument still survives in working order, it is no longer in use, and now the meridian of origin of the world's 
longitude and time is not strictly defined in material form, but from a statistical solution resulting from observa observations of all time. Determination stations which the BIPM takes into account when coordinating the world's time signals. Nevertheless, the line in the old observatory's courtyard today differs no more than a few metres from that imaginary line which is now the prime meridian of the world. So that's Howe's 1997 Greenwich Time and Longitude, uh, Philip Wilson. Um, so let's go back. No, oh, skipping a front, skipping a front, skipping a front. I made a mess of that one. So Greenwich, this this line is still bang on, basically. It's only a few metres out. But they changed it, and this is what, what it's saying here. Indeed, even the Greenwich Meridian itself is not quite what it used to be. Uh, what they do is they use a transit, a number of observa obs <laughs> royal ob observatories all throughout the country. So there's one just south of Edinburgh, and these are all lined up on that meridian line basically um, so uh, but nevertheless the line in the old ob observatory courtyard today differs no more than a few meters so they have all these different ob you know observatories all the way up looking at the sky and it's all digital now anyway but nevertheless the prime meridian of the world the center of the world and the center of clocks no matter where you go in the world come from the prime meridian Greenwich Mean Time what does that tell you yeah. The prime meridian. Prime meridian. Look at this word, prime. Everybody drinking prime, making the children drink prime, they're delivering the prime. 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 Yeah. Is it prime? Amazon prime. Yeah, it is. So the word merry is where we get the word Merlin. Mare is water. So, in the spirit of the creator hovered on the face of the deep, the water. Yeah. The primordial being, you're the prime, you're the primordial, you're the Elohim. Where is this prime meridian? Where is it? Anybody know? Yeah, of course we all know. It's the bottom, bottom of Britain, isn't it? Right down there, the core of the circle, right here, the prime meridian, just in London. Is it inside the city? It probably is, I don't know. But they claim to be the prime. Let's take this line straight up, do you see? This line straight up, this is Arthur the Great Bear and the North Star. So you take a line straight up there, you've got the Spinal Albion straight up here, and you've got the third line, remember we had three, three maidens, three women who carried King Arthur's body in a barge into the great canopy of the heavens through the barge, which came up through here and up onto the spine. Anyway, that's another story. I'll keep that for another day. Prime Meridian. See, the whole world's waiting for these lands and they don't know it. These are the, the sacred lands. 